Thank you, Ali, and uh, thank you, Sue, for preaching my sermon for me. Uh, so if you feel the need to have a snooze, you can drop off now, and I'll try and warn you when to wake up at the end. Um, at one point, my granddaughter uh, got a job working, serving in the harvest. It made me very aware of how rude and unreasonable some customers can be, picking up on the slightest issue, making unreasonable demands, and often trying to get away with getting something for free. On the other hand, it also made me aware of how important appreciation of good service is. And a decent tip always helps, as servers are pretty much at the bottom of the food chain, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, when it comes to remuneration. Our consumer society, can you flick the thing down? Thank you. Might as well have it. Uh, our consumer society demands and expects so much. Amazon Prime will even deliver the same day on many items. And oh, how we love to complain when things don't quite meet our expectations. Now, I say that because Jesus was totally counter-cultural, both for his own culture and for our culture as well. He wasn't about demanding and expecting, but about serving and giving. And so I want to talk this morning about serving Jesus through serving others. We've got two scriptures up there. For Jesus said, for who is greater, the one who is at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at table? But I am among you as one who serves. And he also said, Matthew 20, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Next, please. I think there are a number of problems that we have with serving. It's, um, it's not natural, and pride says we tend to think we're the ones who should be at table. We expect others to come and do stuff for us, and it's not natural. Selfishness means that we'd rather let somebody else do it and pick up the pieces because we don't want to put ourselves out. We don't want to put ourselves into a, a difficult position. And innate prejudice. Now, you may be wrong. At one occasion, our children said to us, you brought us up to be snobs. I'm not quite sure how we were supposed to take that, but um, there, there is often in many of us this sense of uh, feeling somehow that we're better than others. Now, I'm not sure that we did a very good job with our children, but there is that feeling that we feel that we're better than others. And reward. I found, having been a pastor for 40 years in various different churches in different places, that one of the biggest problems in church lives is that people get grumpy because no one said thank you. You know, people who do the same service week after week after week, and they get grumpy. Now, don't get me wrong. Christians hear this. Be the first to appreciate and say thank you and keep doing it because it really matters and it really makes a difference. But is that why we serve? Do you see the, the challenge there? The challenge is we're not serving for a thank you. We have other higher reasons which we will explore in a minute. Serving is not always convenient. It's not always fun. It's easier to talk the talk than to walk the walk. And I would include myself in that. So next, please. We read from John's Gospel, and a very quick uh, squeeze through. John's Gospel 
falls broadly into four parts. There's a prologue, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Then there's what usually uh, academics call the Book of Signs, where Jesus was doing uh, not a miracle a minute as you get in Mark and Luke and some of the others, but uh, particular signs that pointed to who he was and what he was doing. And then from chapter 13 to 20, and we read at the beginning of chapter 13, is what they call the book of glory. And it starts with Jesus watching the disciples' feet. And then there's the epilogue um, uh, when they're at the sea and they're saying, this is why we've written the book and so on and so on. Interesting thing, there is a change of vocabulary from the book of signs to the book of glory. The book of signs, it's all about life. And for John, it's always life with a capital L. Eternal life is not pie in the sky when you die, but it's cake on the plate while you wait. It's here and now. And yes, it's glory when we get there, but it's supposed to begin now, life with a capital L. But when you come to chapter 13 and Jesus begins to minister to his disciples in the upper room, the language changes and the most important word that comes frequently is not life, but love. Agape, love. And uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, what are sometimes called the synoptic gospels, what they tend to do is they trace the humiliation and rejection of Jesus as a growing thing, right the way down to his crucifixion, and then suddenly the resurrection and glory. John is different. John's sometimes been called, a, and, I, and I'm not a mathematician or a physicist, but a parabola of salvation, because it goes down and then it goes up, and there's a curve. And here, in chapter 13, we are at the lowest point of Jesus' humiliation, and it's self-chosen. Self-chosen. Jesus voluntarily takes the form of the lowest household servant or slave, the one who was assigned the task of washing the dusty, smelly feet of visitors and travelers who came into the house. The host didn't do it. The family didn't do it. The lowest of the low. The lowest of the low. And so we have, next slide please, the, um, an acted parable of Jesus' whole life and ministry. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So... He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel round his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped about him. Jesus was secure in his identity, and that enabled him to take the form of a servant. You know, if we're there thinking, I wish somebody would take notice of me and make me feel self-important and what have you, then we're not going to be very good at it. But if we know that we're secure in who we are in Jesus, we can pick up the towel. I think that's quite an important thing. You need to know who you are. Then your service will truly come from a heart of the love that Jesus had. Because he was secure... Uh, that, that voice that came at his baptism, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Because he knew where he had come from and where he was going back to, he didn't need to stand on his dignity, but chose to serve. And in John's gospel, everything is now on the up. And the crucifixion is just a hiccup on the way, if you like. Uh, and uh, John's is the only gospel, therefore, that has the cry of triumph. Tetelestai, it is finished. It's the only gospel to record that. Because Jesus' crucifixion was not the final humiliation in John's understanding. It was a coronation. 
It was a coronation. He had achieved the purpose for which he came. And Jesus sets us an example. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I think there's another bit at the bottom of the slide. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. In his footsteps, we are called to serve. It may not literally mean washing people's feet. You know, sometimes we go, we, we, we make a ritual out of it. It's not meant to be a ritual. It's meant to be a demonstration of what serving and taking the lowest place means. Choosing to take the role of a servant. Picking up the jobs that nobody else wants to do. I'm preaching to myself here. Serving without complaining, even when no one says thank you. And they jolly well ought to, and we should. But no one does very often. And serving, whether in the church family or out in the everyday world, is not just supposed to be something that we do to fellow Christians. It's supposed to be the way that we behave to others. When they said in the early days what set the church apart, they said, see how these Christians love one another. There was something genuine about it. And we do it not because we have to, not because we must, but because we may, because we know that we've been called, we've been saved, we have a destiny in Christ Jesus. That like him, we know where we've come from, from the depths of sin and depravity and loss, and we know where we're going to, glory in the Father's right hand. <clears throat> so Christians are called to serve. Four things. Service is the essence of the gospel. Jesus Christ made himself nothing, it says in Philippians, taking the very nature of a servant. And earlier in that same chapter it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, came to live in our mud and in our mess. <clears throat> it's the essence of the gospel. Jesus acts it out here in John. It's the example that Jesus gave. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he'd come from God and was returning to God, so he got up, took off his outer clothing, just as he did when he came down from heaven, and wrapped a towel around his waist and became the lowest of the low. It's the example of Jesus. It's the calling of Jesus. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. But here's the kicker. It's the power to change the world. Loving Christ-like service is the power to change the world because the one who is in you, thank you, is greater than the one who is in the world. And we do this not because it comes naturally, it doesn't. It's something we have to work at, but we can because his spirit lives in us and because we know that we are on the victory side. Serving is not natural. It's countercultural, it's sacrificial, but is also Christ like. Thank you. 
So often, and I'm the same in this, we expect someone else to do what's necessary. Someone else will teach our children. Someone else will make the coffee. Someone else will clear the snow, if we ever get any, which we don't often these days. Someone else will clean the toilets. Someone else will lead the group. Someone else will go to the prayer meeting or visit the sick or do those admin jobs that no one else is interested in. Someone else will evangelize the new houses or whatever. Meanwhile, we are happy to be at table, to be served by others. But how often do we choose, like Jesus, to take the role of the servant? So questions. Are we consumers when it comes to church? Or are we servants looking for opportunities to serve? Is our first feeling, well, we're happy to have the coffee, to use the clean toilets, and so on and so on, but we're not the ones who think we should be doing it? Do you see how the challenge actually hits the road? Are we givers or just takers? Let's look for opportunities to serve. And we were reminded it's about living with generosity. And it's not just going and doing. It's about praying. It's about time. It's about offering our talents as well. And as well, it's about cash. It's about giving. All these things are ways in which we can serve. But be aware of this. As you walk in Jesus' footsteps, you will be taken advantage of. That's what people do to servants. And that feeling doesn't come naturally. We rail against it. Something inside us wants to give. I, I once went to um, a, a lecture about dealing with stress and difficult people in the ministry that was entitled, What Happens When the Spirit of Slap Has Entered Both Hands? And believe you me, there are plenty of times when you are serving in church life that the spirit of slap enters both hands and you have to sit on them very hard. It's not natural. You will be taken advantage of. It's what people do to those who serve. But in allowing them to take advantage of us, we're actually expressing agape love. We're doing what Jesus did when he humiliated himself by taking off his outer clothing, putting the towel around his waist, washing the feet of the disciples. No wonder Peter objected and said, Lord, you're never going to, and they got into this discussion all about it, you know, and was he talking about baptism, those who, I, I don't know, we're not into that this morning, that's another sermon. So, final slide, please. You can wake up now if you've gone to sleep. The Christian calling is to service. Uh, sometimes, and I feel, two things I feel, this is not in the script. There's excitement because in certain parts of our country, something not quite revival, but close to it is happening. People are being converted. Uh, 17,000 people meeting at Speaker's Corner to hear the gospel. Yes, big church day out and all sorts of other things as well, which are primarily Christian consumerism dressed up in a nice little bow. Um, it's, it's more than that, I know, but you, you hear what I'm saying. But there is something exciting going on, on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, so often in the church, we find that the whip comes out and the drum is beaten. And it's all about, you must get out and do evangelism, talk to people about Jesus, make a nuisance of yourselves, spread the gospel. And I just want to say to you, that puts my back up. And I reckon it puts the back up of the people that we're trying to reach. How about serving instead? I think there's something genuinely Christ-like in that. And it will give you opportunities. 
Whereas if you go in with the arrogance that says, I've got all the answers, now let me tell you about Jesus, you're going to put people's back up and they won't listen. That's just my take on it. Take it how you like. And yes, we do need to engage in evangelism and we do need to hone our skills and we do need to have a passion for the lost and we do need to learn these things. But if we haven't got that spirit of agape love driving our service, then it's not going to work. I won't tell you which church it is, but there's a feeling that uh, what we do to serve in the community is not appreciated because what we need is bums on seats on a Sunday. They don't say that, but that's the message that keeps coming through. I don't believe in it. The Christian calling is to service. It's a sacrificial calling. We may not love the person naturally. We may not relish the task, but we do it because we love Jesus. And so we choose to lay aside the selfish perspectives of pride, prejudice, and prestige. To follow in the footsteps of Jesus as one who serves. The last word with Jesus. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. May God bless you in your Christian service and stir you up not with a sense of guilt that you have to, but with a sense of joy that you may, because he loves you and you know where you're going. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>